Uh, I would like to invite all speakers to the front, and we will open the floor for Q&A. And I would like to take maybe a few questions and then um, have the speakers uh, the chance to respond. Hello, my name is Pekka Karenika and I'm representing the Finnish Red Cross. Um, the first is probably more, more a comment, um, goes to uh, uh, Mr. Konix. The International uh, Committee of the Red Cross has been working on this, as, as you said, uh, <clears throat> quite a lot also. And one of the most disturbing um, outcomes of what the information has been gathered by the ICRC has been that in terms of, of um, absolute figures of attacks against um, healthcare, it's actually different um, actors from governments who are responsible for most of these attacks. <clears throat> A layman could probably assume that it's informal armed groups who are doing this, but instead it's actually government agencies, <clears throat> armies and security forces which are are uh, responsible for most of these attacks. Uh, this is probably an unfair question, but, but I mean, to think that it would be fair for organizations like the WHO maybe to put up a hall of shame, which would list the governments who are actually engaged in these kinds of activities. Probably not because they are, they are your directors in a way, but anyway. Um, the actual question is actually for, for Professor Kunde. Um, the Red Cross was very active when, when, when um, the Ebola uh, was spreading in, in West Africa. And my understanding is that, that our people are actually saying now that, that uh, the virus itself, even if the epidemics is over in a sense, is probably going to be a remaining endemic uh, in West Africa, and we are going to be probably seeing another outbreak of one or the other uh, kind in the future. Do you think that the West African countries are well prepared now for that eventuality? Do you want to take a few questions? Uh, I think we can take a few questions. Please. Thank you. Uh, yes, I can probably continue from my ex-colleague, and uh, my name is Linda Karvenen. I work now for MSF, I'm the project manager in Finland. Um, I want to also take up on a very interesting presentation on the um, dangers of healthcare workers. I think uh, we agree with, with much of what you said, but I'd like to ask how do you see that as relation to what was said? ICRC is doing this, uh, MSF is analyzing its own data, and I think everybody agrees we need the data to understand um, better the why this is happening. And maybe a question in the data that you have now, um, have you already analyzed that you said uh, healthcare facilities, but were there differences of who were the providers? Because today we also have different healthcare providers. We have the ministry, we have NGOs, we have even private. So do you see any data or trends in this? And then you talked a lot about advocacy, which I agree, but I think advocating to the ones that agree with us is maybe not what we need to do. We need to talk to those who are responsible for those attacks. And that's governments, but that's also other armed groups. So how are you seeing that? <clears throat> because you said you will talk to ministers of health, but maybe it's ministers of defense you should be talking to. Thank you. Okay, maybe one more question. Um, hi, I'm Christine from University of Denver. Um, so I'm a student of public health and my question could be quite naive, but I, I do have a couple questions for each of the speaker. Um, with Rudy, I, I'm really curious who are those brave men and women who are volunteering to be health workers in these very dangerous zones. I wonder how the WHO are recruiting them and what kind of compensation are being provided in order to compensate for the sort of danger that they are uh, uh, experiencing every day. And then with the issue of measurement taken to 
secure the health facilities and the health worker themselves. I wonder what has been done on the ground floor to protect these facility and people. Um, I'm thinking about security or you know some sort of protected residential area where they live or it just kind of sparked to, to me that it seems like they need to be protect on the crown somehow and whether or not there has been measure done to do so. Um, with Jules Lin, I really enjoy your talk. I learned so much about um, this relationship between fertility and, 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 and crisis. But I really wonder if it is indeed if you're correct that there's this correlation between women who was born in the war zone ended up and getting married earlier to to kind of provide themselves with more resilience in their life. It seems like a difficult uh, solution, right? How do you provide more education for women at the time of war? I wonder if you have been thinking further into potential policies that could potentially be feasible in the time of a crisis or in a crisis country as such. It seems to be a difficult scenario to deal with. Um, but it's really informative to know that this is the case. I never thought of it that way. For uh, um, uh, uh, um, I'm I was in the US at the time that Ebola uh, broke out and there was a, a lot of discussion and fear and I remember every day there's a different organization trying to get our money, right? It's just like donate because we want to stop this and it seems to be really important. But now that we've gone through it somewhat, I wonder when you were on the ground at the time when the first crisis hit, did you get enough aid, financial aid, financial support, technical assistance? On the ground, what did happen? Because we're living far away and we feel like the only thing we could really do is to provide financial support. But I wonder that you get enough at the time you really need it. Um, and then I have a final question for you. At the time of the crisis, when the first crisis hit and you're at the peak of it, what was the most, what are some of the most challenging factors that contributing to the crisis at the time? Like if you were just to name one, two or three, what was the most difficult thing that you had to do with in that kind of emergency situation? So, thank you. Thank you. So perhaps, uh, Rudy, could you start? All right. The, well, thank you very yes. much. Thank you for the questions. Um, how to, to uh, answer for the uh, question from the Finnish Red Cross gentleman. Uh, our data confirmed that 53% of the tax were by state actors, actually 30% by non-state actors, and there's a number where it's not known. So state actors, um, they are perpetrators. And we discuss a lot with the ICRC, who, of course, has the direct link to talk to the military. And this is one of the things where we have to make sure that police, military know about. The problem is quite often with the non-state actors, because we do not have a direct link uh, to them. and. Today, a number of the non-state actors, it seems like the things that we take for granted, like the respect for the Geneva Conventions, are not accepted anymore as a basis for discussion. So that makes it a little bit extra complicated. Um, but these are the data that we have. Should we do name and shame? Um, of course, it's very difficult for a member state organization like the World Health Organization to do name and shame. Um, but Margaret Chan is not beyond that. <laughs> we have a lot of uh, uh, faith in, in her. She will probably not name a president or a minister by, uh, by name, but she's actually quite vocal. And I can assure you on, for example, the Bahrain case, she was quite vocal with the minister. So, but these are quiet things. And since you're from the Red Cross, you know that quiet diplomacy does work. Um, not all the time. But it makes progress. So yes, we are involved in that also. Um, on the question uh, for uh, from MSF, who were the providers? We did not look that in our data, and this is one of the things we will have to to look into it. But in general, who are the ones bearing the brunt of the attacks? It's the local healthcare providers, the local staff, uh, and we hear quite often we never hear about that. Because if somebody, if somebody from Central African Republic 
upcountry gets attacked, we don't hear about it. When somebody from an MSF hospital gets attacked, we do hear about it. Now that's a good thing, we should hear about it, but we would like to extend that. We should also hear about the local doctors in, in Yemen or in Libya that, that get attacked. Um, the friends, friends are a bit skewed because half of the attacks happen actually in Syria. Uh, Syria is the outline. And somebody was asking another day, is it going up or down? Actually, the data do not allow us to confirm that the trend is up. And in Geneva with MSF, we have been discussing that, and MSF has come to the same conclusion. But Syria skews the, the data so far that, that overall, it, it's, uh, it's well, even that, it's not up, but there's a problem there. So, but we need to do better advocacy and documenting, but we have in the UN, there is a monitoring and reporting mechanism that actually documents and reports to the Secretary General with documentation that actually stands up in court in the Hague, maybe 10 years from now. Uh, that's a mechanism that does exist. And every dictator, every uh, non-state actor that does not respect international humanitarian law should think that 10 years from now, you may contemplate these acts when you're sitting in The Hague in, in, a, in a nice place, but locked up place. So um, that's, we, we, uh, have, we have view that uh, people have to, have to be accountable. Armed groups, we do discuss with armed groups uh, to a certain extent. And when we did polio vaccinations in Syria, um, yes, if you work in health once in a while, you have to talk to the devil. Uh, so that is not beyond us, but it's not for the WHO, indeed, it's not the natural kind of problem. And we discussed this quite a, quite a lot with the ICRC and with uh, MSF in Geneva. I mean, how do we deal with that today? Because things seem to be more complicated. Um, your question on who volunteers, it's not the service providers, it is not they told us not to touch this. <laughs> I was told in no uncertain yeah. terms, don't touch this. We didn't. <laughs> All right. Um, so the, the, the people who do provide the services are the, the national healthcare workers. Quite often it's the humanitarian healthcare workers. And here again, MSF is at the forefront of it. National Red Cross uh, people are at the forefront of it. Uh, humanitarian aid workers in general are there, but the majority, the majority of the people, like in Afghanistan, they are Afghans. They, in, in Iraq, they are Iraqi. It's not the international. We always hear about it when some international healthcare worker gets attacked. So um, even today, there are still people going out and we have lots of people going out and the international community has still a lot of people going out because people work with their heart. We want to help people. We think it's unacceptable that people have to suffer from the consequences of war. And, and we are lucky that there's still a lot of people. But today, um, yes, more and more people pay the highest price for that. And that's a sad thing that we want to stop. What can we do about it? We had uh, with the ICRC, we were part of the Healthcare in Danger project that looked at uh, recommendations, physical sort of protection of hospitals. Um, and there's a whole list of recommendations that has come out. Yes, putting in barriers, but then somebody will say, well, it makes somebody who needs acute care, your ambulance has more, takes them more time to actually get at the hospital. So everything has advantages and disadvantages, but the report is also on, online on the ICRC website. Uh, there's a number of things that can be done. All in all, not 100% satisfactory. So uh, we're still looking to to do this more. As a matter of fact, Monday when I get back to Geneva, we have, with MSF, with ICSC and ourselves, we have an, a meeting on exactly that. What, how can we make hospitals safer? Based on the recommendations that we came out with, we want to go one step further, so we are working on that. We don't have the perfect solution, and that's why things are still happening. And if you have the solution, come and see us. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you so much. First of all, let me congratulate very 
uh, had our partner, uh, starting with uh, Red Cross for the fantastic work, work you done on the field. You know, I was very, very disappointed when we saw the number of death. And death was a very big issue, how to manage death and Red Cross in Guinea, including the Federation of International Red Cross, did a very good job over there. Now, uh, we know for sure that this is not the, the end of the game. We are still uh, on a position to strengthen surveillance. And uh, one week ago, we had a suspected cases in the region where the epidemic started. A, a man came and suddenly died on the street with uh, vomiting and diarrhea. And, uh, the person had been sent to the health facility and there were a rapid test over there for Ebola. That rapid test was positive, but need confirmation. The patient with an ambulance, special ambulance with Red Cross, has been sent to Zerekore where the PCR machine was. And the PCR machine tested the sample was negative. But the end of the story is that was a, an occasion to see if you are ready or not, we are ready. But we are aware that, as you said, the epidemic can occur again because of the virus is circulating and we never know when it can upper, uh, occur again. And we are very cautious after the interruption of uh, the transmission. We spent three months for the uh, follow-up, uh, strengthening surveillance according to WHO recommendation for all these countries. And uh, we are very aware on that situation that the reason the coordination of the response is still transforming to the agency of uh, uh, national security health uh, issue. Uh, in the uh, long duration uh, uh, perspective. Uh, financial aid and support on the ground. You can say that at the beginning there was not too much found and uh, people was very uh, uh, weak uh, support uh, but fortunately, MSF was around and the Red Cross was around and a lot of WHO, including CDC team, they start with a few money. But the big issue was with the awareness and with the advocacy and for these three countries and the magnitude of the epidemics, the international community uh, ha, uh, were in the position to, ma to, to raise a lot of money. But the people and the government was thinking that all this money will go into the treasury. <laughs> treasury. But, but unfortunately, that was not the case because people were not trusting the government. And uh, all the support was spent through NGO. Uh, international uh, community. And now the problem, how to meet the, 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 the need of uh, and uh, the strategy. And that was a little bit uh, this, uh, difficult to, to meet the view, the perspective of an NGO, um, uh, the international uh, uh, institution uh, versus uh, the mean and the priority of the government. But at the end of the day, we, we find uh, a consensus how to spend money. And because uh, at the end, uh, a lot of uh, partners had a lot of money not spent. And they was pushing to spend money. And you, you know how that can be also. What is the most challenging factor for us is the community engagement as well as the engagement of the authority. And that was a very key
key issue, including uh, mobilization, communication, and poverty and ignorance because people was thinking about a lot of rumor. And the rumor on the field make the strategy very difficult to implement. In addition, also, we saw that uh, case management, death management, and mobility was also very challenging because we are in the condition you never know who is who in the field, and people was afraid to, to, to frequent the health facility, the public health facility. They prefer to go to the private, uh, small private uh, sector, and a lot of health worker was uh, infected in the non-official and private uh, sector uh, out of the public sector also. That was a very challenging situation also. Uh, but uh, what make the magnitude of the spread out of the epidemic honestly was the mobility and the migration. Mobility of the body, mobility of the cases, mobility of uh, also the contacts. Could you imagine some people have uh, imagined to have a body, the person body in the car because they want the burial ceremony at their village. And the body was uh, like a soldier at the back of the car trying to transport him on the village. All this is, was a very dangerous situation. But anyway, I think uh, at the end, we managed to have all the situation under control. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, thank you to Rudy and Mandy for such immediate and uh, urgent issues and um, balancing with my very long-term <laughs> response to crises. Um, so I think the, the question to me was, um, so I came up with this policy suggestion that maybe uh, early childbearing isn't the best pathway uh, to resilience and um, other things such as education could be, and how do we implement that um, in a time of in a time of war? Well, when when I did the study, we're looking at war at age zero, and so um, the war doesn't necessarily continue on. So we may be looking at places where the war discontinues, um, and although the return to normal doesn't happen immediately, in in my sample, I did have girls who were exposed to war, but then did go on to uh, receive a high school uh, education. But I think um, more broadly, your question is about implementation and how do we implement uh, pathways to resilience, pathways to empowerment uh, in volatile areas. And that's really the work that I'm going to do in Burundi of how do we bring um, tools of empowerment to the vulnerable populations as well. And so um, maybe these pathways are different for the vulnerable populations than they are for the average population. So I'll come back in two, three years and tell you the answer of that big policy question of um, do we need to address the vulnerable in different ways than we address the, uh, the average population? Or is it just a matter of pulling the vulnerable into our average programs? So, to be continued. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Then the next round is Rachel. With some questions. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Giselquist, and I'm, a, I'm here at UNU Wider. I'm a research fellow. I'm a political scientist, and I work on issues, among other things, of state fragility and governance. So that's sort of where I'm, I'm coming from. Um, but thank you very much for three such interesting presentations, and, and I, I've learned a lot in, in listening to you. Um, I guess I have one question for each of you. Um, for Rudy, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if you can tell us more about the motivations for the attacks. Um, one, if you've collected data on this, at least on the, the stated motivations or the, the aims or what you think the aims might be. Um, because I think that, that certainly has bearing on how you would prevent them, right? So if the, 
if the, the objective is to bring attention to the cause versus it's an expression of frustration or something like this, then you would, you would have different policy responses. So I'm wondering if you could tell us a bit more about motivations. Um, and I guess related to that, um, you mentioned that you're looking at attacks in, in countries in conflict and you find, you find these attacks on healthcare workers in 19 or 17 countries. So what about the countries where we don't have these attacks? What's, is there something different about situations where you do see attacks on healthcare workers where, versus where you don't? And can we tease out something about what type of policy responses might, might work better or worse based on that? Uh, for Jocelyn, um, I, I found it really, really compelling uh, to think, uh, well, the framework that you used to think about the agency of the woman and the, the mother. Um, so I sort of don't want to ask the question, but I will. What about the, the other side? So how do, you, how do you sort of rule out that it's not the, the sexual partner's behavior and, and coercion or motivations that are driving the, the early childbearing that you're finding? Um, and then, for Mandy, <laughs> um, I wanted to, in a way it ties in with my question to Rudy, and I think one of the things that's, that's very striking about uh, uh, the Ebola response and the, um, uh, it certainly comes out in your comments uh, about uh, the Ebola response in, in Guinea is the, the community distrust of, of healthcare workers, including attacks on healthcare workers. And I wonder, um, how do you address this? And how do, you, <laughs> how do you think about addressing this over the long term in terms of thinking about future healthcare crises? Other questions? Um, be able to just add my questions for myself. <laughs> and uh, the question for uh, Jocelyn was asked by Rachel, but I have a question for Rudy and Kader. Um, Rudy, so I think the, the data that you have and presented are large, sadly large, but I think, and I understand that it's very hard to collect them. And I think it's impressive that you have managed to do that in these conflict um, situations, but perhaps uh, where like, I would like to know your thoughts on what are the the research or analytical input that maybe the researchers could provide in looking at those data and saying like, this is the just the number of attacks and people directly uh, directly affected, but what is the larger effect on the health system? And if the health workers are attacked, some of the routine health care, such as vaccinations or taking care of mothers, uh, antenatal care, del delivery, that doesn't function. And so it has a whole, a lot larger implication than just the numbers uh, that you presented. And is that, could that be considered part of the advocacy, like evidence-based advocacy? And what are your thoughts on how to go about that? Um, and, and I think it will be very uh, informative for us researchers to know um, your thoughts on this. And then, uh, Kader, uh, I think the Ebola vaccination is really fascinating in a way that, um, that we've never seen such uh, international collaboration between um, international organizations and countries and agencies uh, all coming together to really speed up the development of the vaccine. Um, and usually it takes five to 10 years more to develop a vaccine. And in, in this case, um, I understand that it's, they're aiming for two to three years. And how, like, I think it's a very exciting model, but is that replicable for other diseases that, in epidemics that could happen in the future? I mean, I, I don't know if something like that could be uh, replicated in the future because it just sounds like there was uh, immense resources required, a lot of uh, energy and you know, a lot of work from people like you in the country on this and, and also a lot of risk um, trying to generate the data and, and uh, conducting the phase three trial. So I would like to know your thoughts on this. Thank you. 
please. Uh, give it a go. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Rachel, for that uh, <coughs> question. The motivation. At the moment, what we collect is, is it intentional or it's not intentional? That's what we collect and that's what we have data on. We would like to know, uh, well, why do people attack healthcare workers and healthcare facilities? And I have my own theory about that. Uh, because today, the provision of healthcare through the international community is actually fairly effective. It's a good thing. It helps people. It gives people hope. It uh, reassures people. So it is something that belligerents take into account. Can we take that away? The fact that MSF comes in and brings hope to people and provides effective healthcare services. We think that's, that's, that's one effect. The demoralizing effect on uh, taking out hospitals or the only place where people can go when they need a an operation, um, it's actually a weapon of war. Uh, not an allowed weapon of war, um, but that's, that's the theory. And I think when well, you were looking for research questions, that's, that's one good research. Why do people do this? Um, <clears throat> so we, we have some theories about that. What about the countries where there are no attacks? Well, the, most of the attacks, they happen in a fairly limited number of countries and and it's the usual suspects it's it's syria it's iraq it's afghanistan it's central african republic it's south sudan these represent uh most of the attacks there is also countries where it went to zero colombia was one of that and in colombia as you know there's a peace process going on people talk to each other they have in colombia uh, a project with the red cross for many years on the La, La Mission Medica, where they use uh, negotiation and a specific sign to ensure that people who are in the medical mission are known and, and respected. Now, it's a bit of an unusual case, but it did seem to work in Colombia. And today, we didn't, well, last year, we didn't see any, any uh, attacks reported. So um, maybe we have to look at it, but it's a limited number of countries where these things happen uh, in conflict. On what else should we investigate? Well, what we would like to demonstrate at some point is, can we attribute that to an attack on healthcare workers? And, and that data, we have, again, our ideas, but we, don't, we have never documented with data that hospital so-and-so was taken out, and as a direct result, so many children died because no C-sections available. If you take out a kidney dialysis center, People who depend on that, they die. I mean, there, there's no three ways about it. Now, usually it's much more complicated than that. And, but if the only healthcare center that provides, let's say, tertiary care, uh, like in Kunduz, is taken out, we think that we can see a measurable effect, but we have never measured that. Mm -hmm. So that's a good research question. Uh, and maybe we have to take that up with you, you and wider. Um, what else can we do? What are coping mechanisms? What are coping mechanisms of the healthcare system? And what are coping mechanisms of people? Because people have their ways of dealing with these questions. Now, if we want to make recommendations that make sense, then it would be good for us to study what are the mechanisms that work? What are the mechanisms that do, do not work? And, and we know from Jocelyn that it's not what you think it is. It's not always what, if you go and study, it's not always clear cut. So we may have to investigate this more in detail and then come up with rec recommendations that, well, uh, improve the lives of people or at least help them to survive better. Because after all, um, if we are unable to make a real difference in the real lives of real people, then for us, it doesn't make sense. We really have to make sure that we put the victims of these attacks at the forefront. And our role is to make sure that we provide better healthcare. And that's why we have to be all in this. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, come. Okay, the first question is how we address uh, the problem with uh, our health worker. For us, uh, the issue was not only the health worker. And uh, 
you know, if you are taking care of having a good case management, it's not only a problem of health care. We saw a lot of involvement of the voluntary from Red Cross. So they are working very hard in front line. And that the reason we think that the good definition is to be the frontline workers, because it's beyond of nurses and doctors, and uh, that is a very important thing to consider. Uh, how we address that? The first thing that when the uh, outbreak occur, it was only the concern of the staff working in the treatment center with uh, MSF, with Red Cross, and, and the other uh, practitioner, and uh, including nurses, doctor, was doing another thing. It's like, it's not a emer national emergency. And most of them have been infected out of this treatment center. Why? Because in that context, people didn't take care of the basic things to protect themselves. The first thing, how to wash their hand with soap or with chlorine. And we started developing the IPC, infection prevention control, everywhere. And to sanitize people, this is a very serious thing. You are, uh, you are uh, uh, taking care of all the patients. We, we never know who is what who is who, and you are treating this patient. You need to protect yourself. And the concern with uh, these uh, workers, uh, there is no clean water at the hospital. If you wait for the government to install all these tap water, you will die. And you need to protect yourself beyond all these uh, situations. And people gradually um, uh, understood that is a very critical and uh, crucial things, and they need to protect themselves. Uh, in addition, also, we put uh, in place, uh, uh, with uh, French cooperation, uh, Army, a special hospitalization ward to take care of all the uh, healthcare uh, and uh, frontline workers just in terms of equity, because they are more exposed. If something wrong occurs, there is a response about that also. What we made is to train and improve the capacity building of all these practitioners on the field, on front line, and uh, decentralizing uh, the treatment center. At the beginning, there was only for the country two treatment centers. And uh, we push to have more than two and to have a lot of case management center in the show with very well trained, equip uh, and protect uh, uh, the people on that. And uh, in uh, emergency context, uh, the ethical committee agreed that the health care worker can benefit from vaccination also even if uh, the vaccine was not licensed, uh, but in emergency context, uh, it was allowed to vaccinate all the people and expose uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the field also. Uh, roughly, that is what we did uh, to, to protect uh, healthcare worker and uh, frontline worker. Coming to uh, Yogo, uh, comment and question. You are right. Uh, uh, I was involved when I was in WHO in Geneva to develop uh, a meningococcal uh, uh, a conjugate vaccine because that was the strain, uh, sprightly uh, 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 in cause with the huge epidemics that took with uh, PATH and WHO. Uh, testing, developing, introducing vaccine 15 years. Uh, that's longer, but we had an experience saying, okay, we can make affordable vaccine 
uh, that can be introduced in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but we are lucky that uh, there was a lot of partnership, including the contribution of transfer of technology, for example. But uh, I think if uh, uh, for Ebola we are lucky that uh, uh, within uh, the coordination of uh, the leadership of WSO, we had a such kind of uh, meeting, putting people together and discussing how are we going to deal. I couldn't say that was not uh, some problem because there was a lot of competition. What we saw is uh, there was not a lot of uh, multicentric uh, consideration, having the same protocol in some country and having a combination of drug also. Uh, that was a very difficult thing to manage. But at the end of the day, we can say that uh, there was a very strong collaboration among all the partners, including clinical trial designer, including also the ATCs, the regulator, including also manufacturers also willing to contribute and to see the way we can uh, manufacture a vaccine. And also regulator, we saw MIA in Europe and FDA people willing to really uh, support country. And there was a political issue also. We held uh, in Conakry a big meeting uh, how to make vaccine, Ebola vaccine and uh, all these uh, emergency vaccine available and affordable for African country. That was a very interesting uh, meeting also to make uh, awareness and advocacy toward uh, a, uh, a good vaccine and to be used uh, in uh, Africa context. Now, I think we, for uh, Ebola vaccine, we were lucky also because uh, when uh, Ebola started in Yambuku and uh, Kikwit also, there was a non-human primate study run and we get a lot of data. And uh, some vaccine was advanced at uh, human stage of vaccine, but there was not political commitment. And they say, you can stop here because there was a lot of issue of bioterrorism and also biosecurity. But when the epidemic occurred, there was already some data and we build on that to save some time and to make shortcuts and to have a vaccine ready. And also I think, uh, uh, during this uh, partnership and uh, the regulator involvement, they saw a way not to jeopardize the process of the, manif of the developing vaccine, but to conduct the phase one or phase two in parallel that make a shortcut to develop vaccine also. Because if you have a phase one, you, you, you need just to, uh, to test the vaccine in a couple of uh, volunteer. And phase two, you can move to 100, 200, and 500. And the way to make that kind of uh, uh, option make a shortcut. Of but when people went to phase one, phase two, Finally, it was difficult to test the vaccine in phase three during the epidemics. And because uh, Guinea was one of the last uh, country to, uh, to interrupt the vaccine, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the epidemic, that's the reason we could be able to test the vaccine during the epidemic. Uh, roughly, that is the, the chance. But I think we learned a lot for example, for the Zika vaccine, I think it's uh, very well uh, uh, developed and uh, advanced. And uh, we had also some uh, uh, vaccine in the pipeline beyond uh, uh, hemorrhagic uh, fever uh, vaccine. But uh, there is some other vaccine that can impact uh, the development on less of vaccine. We can say also 
uh, a country like Guinea, we were very open to test vaccine because it was not easy task to test vaccine because uh, in Geneva, uh, people in our delegation say, ah, Guinea don't want to be guinea pig for this vaccine. <laughs> you see, it, it's not, at each, every uh, step, it was a very crucial step and to see how to deal with all this uh, business. But at the end of the day, I think we can be able to test vaccine by chance, by consensus, by comprehension, by awareness, by advocacy, and to put money on the basket also. Because for giving, for example, we had a strong partnership between Norway, between WHO, MSF, uh, Canada, uh, Can Canada, Welcome Trust. You see such kind of things push together and to get a strong uh, vaccine. Maybe we are lucky also to have uh, a kind of opportunity to, t to test such a number of uh, uh, vaccine and partner. Thank you. And finally, Jocelyn, thank you. Yeah, um, my question was about um, sexual violence and maybe pregnancy resulting from sexual violence. So on the analytic level, I just, um, I got rid of that issue just by um, making it a life course study. So it was only exposure to war um, at age zero, and then we control for our exposure at age three and at age seven. And then if there was any exposure um, after the age of 12, we, we got rid of those girls from the, from the sample. So, um, but that doesn't eliminate, just because I eliminate it from my sample doesn't mean the uh, issue of um, sexual violence in times of crises is eliminated. So um, this is actually one of the projects that I'm pursuing at the moment with Pathfinder and going into refugee camps um, in Burundi and DRC and seeing whether or not women are using, uh, see if there's an elevated um, fertility rate in the camps and if this is a result of building resilience or by um, uh, sexual violence. <coughs> and because I follow this issue, there, um, there have been a few reports in the BBC of women saying that they feel bad that they have children uh, while they're in the camps, um, but they're glad because their child brings them comfort. And so when I read this in the BBC news, I'm thinking, okay, there is not just this life course um, effect of fertility, but a contemporaneous one of the child bringing comfort and possibly resilience. But we cannot ignore this, these acts of sexual violence that also occur in the camps. So that's what we want to do in the, uh, in the study with Pathfinder going into the camps in DRC and Burundi and seeing what is the balance here? How, do, how are women perceiving fertility? Um, it, within the camp context. Um, so that'll be another great mixed methods process. So thank you for the clarifying question. Uh, sorry, J Jocelyn, sorry, I, maybe my question was also about um, how you frame the resilience and so the, the woman becoming mother early on, how do we know that it was by choice and so I, I don't know, well, that would be balanced between the treatment and control uh -huh. group. So um, because, because I get rid of the cases of war um, mm. at the time of childbearing, mm -hmm. so above the age of 12, so both the treatment and control group girls are living in peacetime um, mm. from the age of 12 and, and up. Mm. Um, and so hopefully then there's balance, and so there's, there's balance between... Uh, meaning that mm, the treatment right. and control okay. group uh -huh. both have right. equal chance okay. of becoming pregnant due to sexual violence. Mm. And so in the treatment mm -hmm. group, any extra fertility is going to be attributed to this resilience channel. Thank you yeah. for the clarification. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I think it's 6.30, and thank you very much. Oh, sorry, one last question. Um, is it one question? <coughs> yes, <laughs> so sorry, one final Hello, I'm Anne Paul. I'm from the UN Youth of Finland, and I'm also a paramedic student. So I'm asking about the attacks that happen on healthcare workers. 
my question is, since I was planning on going someday outside of Finland to work, but now it seems like I'm going to die, since the statistics were really drastic, if in two years 1,000 people die in these specific countries, and then 1,500 people get injured, and you were talking about the five A's and the T-shirts, and I can take one if it helps and go to talk to the health minister of Finland if it helps. But I was asking, what are you doing currently in order to seriously help the ones who are there? Is there some things done to make them be more safe? Because the five A's don't help when somebody shots you to the head or something else. Is there something done already to help them? Right. Well, first of all, um, if you feel like going out and help people in a humanitarian mission, um, you are probably still today still safer than driving a car in, in let's say, in Thailand, uh, where lots of people go, or driving a motorcycle in Thailand. That is really dangerous. So it's not like if you go on, on mission, and I, I think MSF will confirm that, there are thousands and thousands of people who go on humanitarian missions and come home safely. So the numbers do include also local workers, and again, a lot of them die, but uh, the demographer will say a thousand people is not so much in the global scheme of things. I'm not trying to belittle, but we should not have the idea that nowadays, if you go on a mission with the Red Cross or with MSF or with the UN, that you have a 70% chance of dying. Not true, okay? So it's really safe. My son is in Gambia right now as we speak. Mm -hmm. I did not prevent him from going to Gambia. Now you can say that maybe that's not a uh, at-risk country, although there's elections in December. <laughs> it will be a very tricky country. So. Um, what do people do? Well, people take safety measures and people evacuate when they think uh, it is too dangerous, still today. Um, and we have this, what we call program criticality analysis. We have that in WHO and the UN. All agencies have that internally. So people do uh, look at it. Is it too dangerous to go? If it's too dangerous, we don't go. What are the measures we can take? And there's different measures. It's not wearing a flag jacket. Usually it's about talking to all parties to the conflict and making sure that you're known. And the attacks that we see, especially on humanitarian aid workers, is, there is there's a failure in that system. Um, if today a Red Cross <coughs> worker is attacked, usually, I've worked for the Red Cross for 17 years. So, um, there is always a discussion going on. We are working here. This is what we do. Um, we hope you appreciate that, and please keep our people safe. I know that MSF is doing also like that. So everybody does that. So there's lots of things that are being done. Um, but I really want to make sure that you don't walk away here that if you go on a humanitarian mission, um, it's a suicide mission. No, that is not true. Um, but if you want to go and drive a motorcycle in Thailand, come and see me, because that is really dangerous. Thank you. Well, it's good that we took that last question. <laughs> and thank you all for being here. And special thanks to the three speakers.